I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Hello, Ryan. <laughs> Episode 95. 95. We're getting that's, closer. Yeah, that's like, you know, that is a lot of things. If you have 95 of something, you're like, wow, that is, <laughs> that is a lot. It's a collection. Yeah, exactly. Have you noticed, I've noticed when I tell people I have a podcast, they sort of roll their eyes like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you send them the link and they see 95 episodes. And one, there's a look of pity on their face, but <laughs> yeah. then also they, they say, oh, like you actually have a podcast. Right. Yeah. Once you've, once you've crossed that, that number 50, it's, you know, you're dedicated to podcast. Exactly. This is the case I'm no. making to the Rick <laughs> Steves people. I mean, this isn't the quest for Rick Steves segment, but I just want you to know, I still got those emails out there. I'm, I'm knocking on doors. I'm making calls, working the network. And, uh, you know, I got a good, good feeling. Yeah, we've got a couple months left before this 100th episode drops. So Rick has time. Now, Ryan, I don't want to uh, dilly dally too much on the top here, mostly because uh, we are we are this is the second installment of our guide to Boston, one of our patented, celebrated, uh, award winning uh, city guides, which are proved to be so popular uh, with with folks who are traveling to different places. They find the podcast, they download the series, and this is the second in the three part Boston trilogy. Yeah, Boston gets its own trilogy. Not since the Revolutionary War has there been so much media made about Boston. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the first installment was all the big hits. So if, you know, if you had two days here, you want to go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston Common, the Public Garden. Now, this episode is, this is more of like an insider's episode. This is uh, my list of places. If you have that second day, or if you want a little bit off the beaten path, not that these are all the way off the beaten path, but this is my my personal list of must see places in Boston. So I would say a little little cooler, a little hipper, maybe a little nerdier, and uh, would make for a great addition to any trip to Boston. I think you know if if folks know that you've planned the episode a little nerdier, you know that's that, you don't need to say that. It's, it's just not part of it. As a surprise, we're going to be spending yeah. a lot of time uh, in museums and on university campuses. Just to yeah, I mean, I do it a little bit. I imagine, you know, we're going to go into who has the best uh, bean selection uh, in, you know, in, in, in the Boston market, things like that. I mean, you joke, but uh, I just got an alert that my Rancho Gordo quarterly uh, package is on its way. I look forward to this uh, every quarter. You know, what's really funny is uh, one, uh, Kevin, who's a listener of ours, uh, who's a fellow uh, political tech guy. Uh, is also a Rancho Gordo subscriber. So you 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 guys would be like BFFs. I got to connect you. I just I just need to um, correct something that you just said, which is you called us Rancho Gordo subscribers. We're not subscribers. We belong to what is called the Bean Club, has a multi-thousand person wait list. So when you say subscriber, that suggests that it's just kind of the hoi polloi. Anybody can roll up and buy some beans uh, with a subscription. Not so. You need to apply. There's an application process. Then you need to wait until your turn. Usually uh, passed down through families. <laughs> um, you have to inherit a subscription. Or you have to inherit a Beaten Club membership. So uh, I'm like, Char Charlie, Charlie has no idea how lucky he is. That's exactly right. Yeah, beans for the rest of his life. I mean, and while we're on beans, uh, th this prompts me to say, Ryan, I think we better get to Boston. Part two, Kiernan's Picks. Well, I think it's time to jump on the Amtrak and head to Boston. Oh, the Acela. Tell the cabin crew. Cabin crew? Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. Oh, my gosh. We are in Boston. We're at Fenway Park. I just heard somebody yell something racist. You know, <laughs> I feel right at home. Oh, my God, Ryan. <laughs> Listen, we gave the world JFK, all right? Show some respect. Yeah, that tech. was that was Ireland via Boston. So that's right. And, you know, we're going to actually explore in this episode, not just Boston, but Boston and its environs, um, because there's a lot of great uh, historical landmarks and things you want to visit outside of Boston proper. And Boston itself is a, is a quite compact city. Uh, so you can explore a lot of it. And then some of uh, its attractions are, are in the, the I would say it's like an, an equivalent to the boroughs uh, of Manhattan. You know, you live in, in Brooklyn. I live in Somerville, which I kind of think as a, a satellite, a borough of uh, Boston. So we're going to hit Boston. We're going to hit uh, Cambridge. We're going to head out to, to Lexington and Concord. We're, we're, we're covering the whole region here. 
Have you, you spent some time in Cambridge in your life? You know, it's, that's going to come across, Ryan, because of <laughs> course today we're going to uh, have to talk about Harvard University, the oldest university in the U.S., and yes, my alma mater. That is in Cambridge. I had forgotten. I was thinking MIT. So you know how it goes. We're going to talk a lot about MIT too. <laughs> As you know, a, a school that's also very close to my heart. But before that, I want to start off with some uh, parks right in Boston itself. Ryan, you remember last time we talked about the Boston Common and the Public Garden. Yes. Now, one thing that I didn't mention was that uh, those two parks are actually part of a string of parks that span all through Boston and into Brookline, Massachusetts. And it, it has a lovely uh, name called the Emerald Necklace. The Emerald Necklace. And this is designed by Olmsted. And this is another Brooklyn-Boston connection because, of course, Olmsted designed the Greenwood Cemetery, uh, Central Park, which is right. not in Brooklyn. But, right, right, right. you know, about as famous of a park designer as you get. That's exactly right. And uh, it covers 1,100 acres of park. And many of them are, you know, compact and they actually kind of ring the city, which is why they're called the Emerald Necklace of Parks. And I should mention, uh, now I'm, I'm not putting this on the official must hit list. This would be in maybe Boston episode part seven. But uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, for those of you who are uh, incredibly interested in parks, landscape, architecture, uh, I, obviously he's the, the preeminent name in that, uh, that uh, practice. His uh, home is actually a national park protected uh, attraction that you can visit. You can see uh, where his workshop was, where he designed all these parks. He had several uh, workers there. Very interesting. I've been and it's in Brookline, so, so not far from where all these parks are. And if, and if you dropped in the middle of his house, well, you, you would see a miniature Central Park and you know immediately this is Olmsted. Uh, so you are uh, referring to my test of a good na uh, historic home, which is if I dropped in blindfolded, you took the blindfold off. Let me look around for about 30 seconds. Could I guess whose home it is? And I will say they have a lot of the uh, historic blueprints uh, that the, the workshop laid out. And so I feel pretty confident that I would guess Olmsted within three guesses. So I, I would say yes, that it meets my criteria. Great. Well, I, I, that would be on my list because, you know, I am a fan of both Olmsted and historic houses. So it might be on your seventh episode, but it'd be, on, it'd be <laughs> higher on my list. And uh, I want to uh, highlight there, there are a lot of great parks as part of the Emerald Necklace. And uh, in the show notes, I will drop a link to... Uh, the website of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, which is the nonprofit that uh, protects and beautifies these parks today. And they have great downloadable maps and you can explore where you want to walk and maybe you'll be near a museum and you'll notice a park is right across from there. Um, two that I, I really love uh, are, one is the Back Bay Fens, um, which is, um, as Fens suggests, uh, it's, it's a bit more of a swampy kind of uh, a more uh, naturalistic park. Uh, that you can walk by. And there's a lot of other attractions near there. It's near uh, the major museums we covered in the last episode. Uh, but especially there's a, there's a great little uh, sort of secret Boston uh, historic landmark that you can see in a park called Franklin Park. Franklin Park Zoo was founded in 1912. And at first it was open to the public uh, just for free. And it was just meant to be an attraction in the park that you would come out and check out. And it fell on hard times in the 1930s and they closed a number of the attractions and it was later uh, reopened as a, a for-profit. You have to pay at the gate. But what's so interesting is that they didn't take down all of the enclosures from when it was a free park. And so there are actually ruins of the bear enclosure, also the badger enclosure, but the bear enclosure is the one you're really going to go visit. And you can actually go in and visit. You see some of the old fences and they have a great uh, um, uh, carving of two majestic bears. And, you know, it, this was a time where zoos didn't uh, didn't outfit the place so that the animals felt like they were in their natural habitat. So it's basically just a cement shell with some rocks. Uh, I, don't know the, I don't know. I don't know. The animals feel that way now. <laughs> <laughs> I've just, having just gone to the Bronx Zoo recently, I didn't feel like, uh, you know, I was on a safari. Well, it feels like a, a snapshot uh, of this particular time, this Franklin Park bear enclosure. And it, you could walk right by it and not realize quite what it is. But I would really recommend go go for a nice walk in Franklin Park, which is a, an expansive area, and, and check out this bear enclosure. Take some photos by the great carving because it's, uh, it's, it's really quite eye-catching. 
Ren, are there uh, comparable historic baron closures uh, in New York? Yes, uh, the Stonewall Inn. I think is is is, is best known for uh, Ryan. <laughs> Um, that, and, uh, if I, if you're looking at the, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy maps, I'd also recommend a, a nice jaunt around Jamaica Pond if you have the time, uh, a really lovely area, but, uh, past the Emerald Necklace of Parks, I also Ren, you know me, I can't resist a national park site. And just outside of Boston in, uh, Concord, Lexington, and let's see in Lexington, Lincoln and Concord. There is a, a, a historic park, a the Minuteman National Historic Park. Now, have you have you ever been there, Ren? I don't think that I've been there. No. All right, Ryan. So, what Minuteman National Historic Park preserves is considered the opening battle of the Revolutionary War. So, on April nineteenth, seventeen seventy five, this is the first time that the Minutemen were told to fire back at the British troops. And what I really like in the park is that it, it, they have a wonderful trail. It's five miles long, and they call it Battle Road Trail. And it brings you from Lexington to Concord. And it covers off places like where Paul Revere was captured during his midnight ride. And it covers the full area where 1,700 British soldiers were fighting 4,000 colonial militia. Because this battle really took place all along the road from Boston to Lexington Concord. Um, and all along the trail, they have interesting interpretations and sites. They have uh, colonial buildings that have been rebuilt. And they try to really recreate the landscape as it would have been during this time. This sounds right in my alley. I mean, of course, I've read about this many times, but I've never actually been there. This might be this might be on the top of my next list. This, this really should be at the top yeah. of your list. And uh, many people have heard, interested in the Revolutionary War may remember the North Bridge in Concord, and that's where some of the fighting broke out. And there is a, a quite famous statue there by none other than Daniel Chester French, who's you know always the most famous. He's the one who did the Lincoln Memorial. He's out there always making iconic statues. And uh, it, it, he has a sculpture of a Minuteman, a statue of a Minuteman. That has become iconic uh, in in Boston uh, lore and tourism. Yeah, this is a very familiar image. Um, you know, looking at the sculpture now. Yeah, and I, in fact, I uh, in my, I think I've spoken on a, a previous last stop. I, I bought a historic poster uh, that advertised this uh, the Minuteman National Park, and uh, it's got these bright colors. I'll I'll put a link to it in the show notes because it's such an interesting um, uh, it's such an interesting composition. And it was made by an artist named Paul Rand, who uh, for folks who know the famous IBM logo and sort of typography nerds, he's like a real uh, iconic figure. So uh, at the Minuteman uh, actually uh, is portrayed behind the word Minuteman. It's very very cool. And the another little interesting tidbit is the statue is actually made from. Um, bronze from Civil War era cannons. So it was put up right after the Civil War and they actually used the bronze from the Civil War cannons to, to make it. Exactly. And so, uh, you know, I encourage you to go there. The autumn is a particularly lovely time to visit because it's in a wooded area. Uh, one thing that they do a great job of bringing to life is uh, they tell stories of families that lived along this road and what, you know, whether they were hiding or supporting the revolutionary cause, some, you know, left behind their, their families to go out and fight that night. And the family was left to hearing shots in the distance, not knowing if they were going to come back. And it's extremely evocative. Um, and of course, in non COVID times, they do open up the, uh, the research center there where they are actively still, uh, doing archeological digs in this area finding bullets in areas that they didn't know there was active fighting. Even to this day, they're still discovering uh, new sites. That's fantastic. It's so cool to, you know, be at an active site like that. Totally. And also a great place for biking. Uh, so it's a walking path, but uh, it's, it's paved enough that if, if you've got a baby stroller like I do, you can, you can use it there and you, you share it uh, with bikes. Sounds good. Also, Ryan, uh, just in case you were interested, from this battle, British casualties, 273 colonial casualties 96 it was it was a promising start yeah it didn't go that it didn't 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 stay that way <laughs> <laughs> all right all right yeah. we don't have to hey we still we still won we still won it's true yeah well, well the revolutionary war history podcast you know in the works folks but this is not it 
Yeah. So uh, definitely make time for visiting the Minuteman uh, National Historic Park, and uh, particularly in autumn. Now, Ryan, the next park and the final park that I want to recommend on its own is called the Arnold Arboretum. And this is actually a a Harvard-owned site, though it is not in Cambridge. It's not near the, the Harvard campus proper. And it describes itself as a museum of trees teaching the world about plants. And so it is both a beautifully curated park with many different paths that you can walk through, but it is also an education center where uh, Harvard students and the public go to learn about horticulture. I've never even heard of this, and I've been to the campus so many times. Well, again, it's not at the campus. I want to emphasize that. So if you want to visit the Arboretum, you're going to most likely you'll have to take an Uber or a Lyft out there or if you have access to a rental car. You can get there from public transportation, but, uh, you know, always making the best use of your times. And it's it's gorgeous um, because it's not, you know, greenhouses. It is actually an outside wild park where they actively uh, grow and maintain uh, lots of different plants and trees from around the world. And there are areas where active scientific studies going on. Um, the site that gives a, a great uh, set of walking tours that you can take along with uh, descriptions of what you'll see, major plants that you can learn about uh, along the way. And I particularly love, um, in COVID times, they have been doing free Zoom lectures. And the last one, just to give you a sense of how academic they get, the last one was called The Pecan, A History of America's Native Nut. That sounds uh, tasty. <laughs> I mean, you know I'm a bean man, but I, I have to say... Oh, you're, you're a little bit of a nut man too, I bet. I, th- this is, <laughs> this is defi- definitely tempting me towards the nuts. I don't know that there's that many varietals. <laughs> I think this will be a really pleasant uh, you know, place to visit in the spring, you know, as, as the world's reopening. Go check it out. Yes, Ryan. Uh, I mean, it's great at all times of year. I think it has a really stark beauty at uh, this time of year, but certainly the spring is when it really comes to life. And uh, you can check on the website. They had, they, they do show um, when different, they do spotlight certain plants that will come into bloom and that, uh, you know, give you the wonderful smells and visuals at different parts of the the spring and summer. Do they have uh, pecan trees there? Well, Ryan, listen, you're going to have to watch the lecture yourself to learn about how the Arboretum uh, relates to the pecan or pecan trees. But I will say in the description, it says that the pecan tree went from being primarily wild to primarily domesticated within just a matter of decades. So it's that sort of uh, thrilling tale that you can expect from these online Zoom lectures. Yeah, well, I like my pecans natural and not domesticated, but, you know. <laughs> also, I think, you know, like, while I say that in a mocking voice, I'm definitely watching this. I mean, this is, you know, <laughs> we, we've all watched everything on Netflix. What, am I going to watch The Queen's Gambit for the third time? Yeah, yeah. I, we're down to lectures on nuts, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's that point. It's at that point in the pandemic. Well, Ryan, I mean, I know you have a profound interest in nuts. Uh, you've alluded to it on the show a number of times. But another thing I know that you're interested in is, and I I already talked about him at the top, JFK. You know, JFK and Boston, uh, you know, go together, uh, you know, like the Red Sox in Boston. uh, Yeah, of course, of course. You can actually visit the home where he was born in Brookline, uh, which is on 83 Beale Street, um, also from Brookline, Conan O'Brien. But where I would actually have you go for for serious JFK history is, and many people don't realize that this is here, the JFK Presidential Library. You know, and I as many times as I've been to Boston, I've never been. And that's that's a real shame because I do love presidential libraries. So I I'll tell you exactly why you haven't been, though. It is difficult to get to. It's difficult to get to on public transportation. You really need a car to get there. But it is well worth the kind of winding path that it takes to get there because, you know, it's a presidential library dedicated to JFK. They've got a great uh, opening film that teaches you all about his presidency at large and then rotating exhibits that bring in a really rich uh, uh, collection of papers, memorabilia and, uh, you know, even even outfits uh, from the Kennedys. But I'd like to tell you, Ryan, about my favorite thing that they hold in their collection. What is it? So, uh, you know, uh, Kennedy was a Navy man, right? Of course. PT-109. 
Do a PT-109. And what is the story of PT-109, Ryan? Something very heroic that he wrote as a uh, memoir, as someone wrote as a memoir, <laughs> and, uh, you know, made him famous. That's right. So uh, he was on a, a PT-109 that crashed, and uh, JFK was extremely heroic in, in uh, you know, leading the men uh, to a local island. And on the island, he actually carved into a, a coconut a message that he then gave to, to native people who lived on the island to get it back to uh, an American base so that his crew could be rescued. Wow. And what did he write on the coconut? So I, I can't, uh, I, I can't, oh, okay. So what he wrote on the coconut was narrow ISL island, commander, native nose position, he can pilot, 11 alive, need small boat, Kennedy. Wow. I mean, this is the stuff of Hollywood. Yeah, that's, that's, fant- that's fantastic. You do have it's like, a, like, like Gilligan's Island <laughs> with the Kennedys, you know, it's like uh, Kenny Mupcourt. <laughs> you do have to wonder whether his father, Joe, who was so determined to have one of his, his boys become president. Uh, it, it, it doesn't this seem a little uh, uh, planned, <laughs> particularly that he carved in Kennedy. Do you know how hard it is to carve into a coconut? Any additional letters? Well, if he had been thinking about it, he would have put JFK. You know, uh, if it had true. been, yeah, that would have been the branding recommendation. I mean, Ob- is- Obama would have put the little like, you know, a uh, sun or uh, 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 yeah, American yeah. flag rising over the well, he's Iowa, also got Iowa the, planes. The big O that he writes Obama like coming out of. Uh, yes, you know, that yes. Happens. That's very classy. But it's, of course, why I also go by KPS. You you want to be in the in the FDR, JFK, LBJ category. So KPS. KPS. Uh, what one interesting thing is, Ryan, the the coconut does not exist as a full coconut anymore because uh, JFK's father actually had the shell encased in plastic and put on a base, and JFK used to keep it in the Oval Office as a paperweight on his desk. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, so they have lots of uh, uh, great, interesting things there. There's a lot of uh, Jackie O um, information, and you, you learn a lot about her life. She was actually quite a, a talented uh, doodler, so you get a lot of drawings by her, and you, you can see her report cards. I mean, it's really a deep dive into the Kennedy age. So for anyone interested in presidential history or the Kennedys specifically, uh, head out to the JFK Presidential Library. And I think that's something we should explore more in a future episode, just JFK's Boston. Oh, I mean, there, there's absolutely pl- plenty to go off of for that. So uh, yes, indeed. And we will actually be, of course, going to his alma mater, also Harvard, uh, just a little later. Ah, exciting. And, uh, you know, if you're traveling with kids, I would definitely recommend uh, two museums in addition. One, the New England Aquarium, which is a wonderful uh, standout famous aquarium right on, along the, the shore. And uh, the, the harbor is going to be the focus of Boston Part 3. So I'll give you a few more details on the New England Aquarium then. Uh, But also the Museum of Science is a a great place to bring kids, uh, get them interested in science, Uh, big Omni theater, always showing an interesting uh, documentary. Um, And they have really interesting things like they can create lightning indoors, um, really fun uh, rotating exhibits that once they did the the science behind Star Wars, for example. Uh, So see what's going on at the Boston Museum of Science. I love those museums where kids get to play with things, you know? Absolutely. But not just kids, Ryan. We're all kids at heart. Right. Yeah, that's fair enough. And Ryan, now it's time I'm going to ask you to put on your blazer, put on your tie, maybe put some horn-rimmed glasses, because we are heading to the hallowed halls of MIT and Harvard. Uh, you feel so at home right now, Kiernan. This is not out of office. This, is, this for you is at home with Kiernan Schmidt. <laughs> that's exactly right. So, Ryan, like uh, any old, historic, world-famous university, there's lots and lots of things to see just walking around and exploring MIT and Harvard. So I'm going to point to a few pieces. I'm not going to give it, you know, most people know MIT and Harvard generally know their history. Um, So these are just a few pieces that I would recommend you try to see while you're taking in the campus at large. So MIT, of course, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Ryan, you know, I've, uh, I've worked uh, with MIT for, gosh, I think I covered about six years of my career working with MIT. So I've spent a lot of time there. And it does have the kind of like mad scientist feel about it, where if you're walking through the classroom buildings, 
you can peek into windows and see, you know, smoking beakers and very complicated scientific instruments. So it's really fun. You feel like you walked into the Muppet Labs a little bit. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've been through work, been lucky enough to spend some time at like the MIT Media Lab. And, you know, you're walking around that and there's like, you know, holograms and rooms that are moving by itself. I mean, it's a right. little like Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. pretty fantastic. Exactly. And uh, you definitely get the sense that there's a lot of brilliant people around you. Um, they have a, a lovely statue that feels very MIT to me called the Alchemist. And it's right on Mass Ave, um, just before you go into the, really the, the primary historic building everybody knows. When you picture MIT, there's a, there's a building that's right on the waterfront, right on the Charles. And there's a, a great iconic dome that is very much the, the uh, trademark of the university. And in fact, it was inspired by Thomas Jefferson's uh, adaptation uh, for the University of Virginia of the Roman Pantheon dome. So if it looks familiar from the Pantheon from the University of Virginia, uh, you know, MIT decided to, to make it their own. And it is quite extraordinary. It but is. It is quite extraordinary. And the, st the statue is called the Alchemist. And uh, it's a statue called the Alchemist. And it, it was uh, installed in 2010. Uh, it commissioned by an anonymous donor for the school. And it celebrated the Institute's 150th anniversary. And you can tell this was like a custom MIT piece because it's a person uh, who is made out of numbers. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very interesting. Many people take a, a photo that they want to post on social media on. It's very Instagrammable. Um, because you can stand right aside it, and it's almost like a frame of, of a person that's completely made from uh, different numbers. Yeah, and and you know, one of the things I've always thought looking at it is that it's like, uh, you know, it's a person's like, you know, molecular. You know, it's like it's like yes, kind of coming right. together, but it, you know, it's it it sort of feels like ephemeral. And then when you get closer to it, you you notice that it is made out of of all the numbers, but sort of farther away, uh, it just sort of looks like a person materializing or dematerializing. Exactly. And uh, I'll throw a link in the show notes and, uh, of course, put it on the uh, old Instagram oh, at OOO podcast. Like, ooh, ooh, Al podcast. And uh, when you walk into the building that is uh, under the Great Dome, there's a, a, a seemingly endless hallways of classrooms and offices. And that is known uh, on campus as the infinite quarter because it goes forever. And, of course, anything they can tie to a a science or mathematical term becomes part of the campus lore. So you walk and in the infinite quarter. And boy, is it hard to find a classroom here if you're a stranger like I've been. <laughs> that, you are exactly right because it, it is, it's, it, actually your comparison to Hogwarts was uh, fantastic because they have a very quirky number system for every single building and room on campus. And unless you're in the know, you are not in the know. <laughs> yeah, there is yeah. a web, there, there's a website uh, that was created by students just kind of cobbled together of like, where is it at MIT? I'll, I'll throw it in the show notes in case you're looking for something specific. But for the regular tourists, you're going to really just want to walk through the infinite corridor. And by the way, MIT is going to hate that I'm telling you that because they, they get so many tourists going in the infinite corridor. It can be hard for the students to get to their classes on time. Especially with the global pandemic. <laughs> but I don't just want you to walk the infinite quarter. I want you to enter at the Massachusetts Avenue entrance, uh, which has uh, large pillars. You go walk through a bunch of classrooms. You're going to see a lot of these crazy scientist sites. Uh, you're going to pass under the Great Dome and then you continue on and you get to a building that is labeled Building 6C because the infinite quarter runs through a number of buildings. And this is the physics department. And there is actually yet another great piece of artwork that anybody can see from several vantage points. Uh, just at the end of the hallway, you hit the end of the infant quarter, you hang a right, and you look out a door at a Solowit installation on the U-shaped uh, floor of an atrium in the building. And it's called Bars of Colors Within Squares. Bars of Colors Within Squares. It's very, you know, it, it says exactly what it is. Yeah. Now, Ryan, you know Solowit's work? I, a, a little bit. And I have seen this. I don't think I knew what it was all about until you, you're telling me now. But I, 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 I recall seeing this. 
it's it's all about uh, bright, bold colors and geometric shapes. And so uh, uh, many times uh, uh, MIT uses it to, to great effect. Sometimes when they have, you know, a new administrator join, they'll take a picture uh, with this in the background. And it is really striking the, the scale of this uh, artwork. And it really does brighten up the whole experience of a visit. So certainly uh, search out Solowitz, bars of colors within squares. And if you have to ask a student, uh, you know, d- d- definitely do it. It's worth searching out, but it can be hard to find. Now, Ryan, you know, one of the wonderful things about visiting a university, of course, is you get all the, 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 the lore of the place, right? Like when, it, when a university has been around for as long as an MIT or a Harvard, you're going to get some stories. Yeah, like, like that guy, that Will Hunting, who went to MIT, and he was <laughs> yeah, like an amazing mathematician. Yeah, that's a great Exa- story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> True stories <laughs> like Good Will Hunting. <laughs> and uh, one of the stories I especially love that you can experience when you visit MIT is that right by MIT, there is a, there's a big street. Uh, it, actually, it's right outside the Infinite Corridor, and uh, it's called Mass Ave. And Mass Ave uh, takes you over the Charles River into Boston over a, a a really long bridge that you can take a nice scenic walk over. And it's called the Harvard Bridge, ironically, even though it's at MIT. And what's very special about this bridge is it's got some of this great MIT lore, which is it's about a man, a student, a a student who was at MIT in 1958. His name was Oliver Smoot. Have you ever heard of Oliver Smoot? I have have not. I was trying to make a good joke about Smoot, but I I failed. So no, I have not. So Oliver Smoot, uh, last name is S M O O T, and it was very fortuitous that Mr. Smoot had a nice, funny name because when he was uh, uh, pledging a fraternity at MIT, one of his tasks was that he had to measure out the bridge in a new unit of measurement to be called the Smoot, and the idea was that the Smoot, one Smoot, would be uh, as long as Oliver Smoot himself, and the idea is that he would lay down across the bridge at every interval, you know, of his, of his length and mark down how many smoots the bridge was. So a smoot is his height, which is five feet, seven inches. Not, not a tall man. No, not a terribly tall man. And, uh, the, the bridge itself is 364.4 smoots, though MITers like to add, it is 364.4 364.4 smoots plus one ear. Just you know, a little cute joke. <laughs> oh, and if you, if you go on the bridge today, you can see the smoot markers are still there today. They're regularly refreshed and repainted. Smoot is a major part of MIT's history. Oh, and Ryan, can I tell you the, the funniest thing about Oliver Smoot? Yes. He went on to be the president of the International Organization for Standardization and the chairman of the American National Standards Institute. So this pledge activity actually paved the way for his career in measurement unit standardization. Wow. You know, it makes you question what you did in college. (laughs) (laughs) I question what I did in college, uh, you know, quite a bit. (laughs) So do the authorities. <laughs> so uh, you got to go see the, the smoots. And then the, the final thing that I would recommend for folks uh, at MIT is there is a wonderful MIT museum that is like a grown up version of the Boston Museum of Science. So where the Museum of Science has, has wonderful uh, uh, explorations for the whole family. It's especially kid friendly. The MIT Museum often features rotating exhibitions about ongoing research or breakthroughs that are happening on the campus. Or uh, they even com- do a nice job of combining engineering topics and artistic topics. So you can see things like kinetic sculptures that are running and are really interesting to, to watch. I'll post a couple of those on the old Instagram. I feel like I often say I'll post stuff on the Instagram that never makes it to way there. I, but, I, I, but this one, I yeah, promise. That's good. I really want to see that Instagram come to life after this episode. It's good. It's going to come to life. So the MIT Museum, it's one of the hidden treasure museums uh, of Boston. So while you're close by, definitely stop in. I've never been. I, I would love to see that. Have you not been? That's funny. I know I have. Oh, it's really, really cool. And these kinetic sculptures... The kinetic sculptures are like uh, pieces of clockwork that are made to do interesting activities. So it might be making little cars run or making like a butter, a, a robotic butterfly flap. Very, very neat. That's cool. All right, Ryan. And then, of course, of course, no trip to Boston 
uh, curated by Kieran and Pishme, is going to be complete without a, a visit to my alma mater, uh, you know, a, a gift to America, <laughs> Harvard University. Harvard University. I, you know, I had forgotten that you went to Harvard. Oh, oh that, wow. Really? I haven't mentioned that to you in a while? No, no, that's amazing. It means a lot to me that you forgot. <laughs> now, Just Ryan, so you, you could spent, tell me again. Y- exactly. Now, you, you've spent a little time uh, over at Harvard, right? I have, yes. Through my various startup activities, I've spent some time <laughs> in the yard. You're very at the yard and you've yeah. you stayed in, Lowell some, House. Uh, in the in the Lowell House. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the heart of a visit to Harvard is, of course, Harvard Yard, which you're referencing, which is a beautiful uh, 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 yard that is enclosed by a, 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 a fence and, and a bunch of old red brick buildings that you associate commonly with Harvard University. And there are plenty of tours that you can take. There's a paid tour from a company called the Harvard Tour, but there's also a student organization that does a really great history tour. Uh, It's called the Crimson Key Organization, and you could take a student tour there. Or if you don't have time uh, or they're not running that tour, jump on an admissions tour. Uh, You you know, you don't have to be applying to the school and you'll still get a good dose of the history. Yeah. (laughs) I think... You know, I think even if you're not applying to the school, you might have children one day that will apply. So it's worth going. Absolutely. And uh, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give here just a couple of the highlights that you'll see on a Harvard Yard tour. But again, the tour guides will give you even more information. Um, so so the, the yard itself is a, a lovely, quiet respite from city life. And, uh, you know, they have lovely chairs sitting out in nicer weather. There's big stately trees hanging over the place and you're surrounded by academic life and the, you know, the buzz and youthful energy of a student body. And uh, Ryan, there's a statue there of John Harvard himself. Do you remember this statue? Oh, I remember the statue. Um, you know, and it's also the statue actually is, is a character in the social network, the film, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah. Well, they, I mean, they, they, there's a, there seems to be some sort of I don't want to say this if it's not true, but some sort of Harvard sort of thing that y'all do where you, you pee on the gentleman. That's true. There is a tradition where um, students enjoy urinating on the foot of the statue, which you have to really, foot. you have to kind of be aim for. Very, well, it's very high up off the ground, so right. you really have to climb up and then pee down. Based yeah. on how, if I, I had done it, I would have backed and I would have just, it would, I would have peed all over his face. Just you know, <laughs> it's just tough for me to aim so low. But yeah. I mean, I feel sure that with the number of drunken students who have attempted this, the whole thing is just covered in urine. <laughs> But the, the reason people pee onto the foot is because the foot is uh, rubbed for good luck by visitors to the campus and students. So the foot is actually rubbed completely clean and uh, looks very different than the rest of the statue. It's nice and shiny because of all the human hand oils right. that have been on it. All right. So right after before after you rub it, you should wash your hands thoroughly. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Which in COVID times you should do anyway all the time. Does that make sense? And uh, the the John Harvard statue is famously known as the Statue of Three Lies. And that's because if you're visiting the yard and you're looking at the statue, there are three things on it that are patently false. Here in this place that is supposed to be a university that protects and brings to light truths, uh, is the, the very symbol of it has three lies on it. And the first is that it says, John Harvard founder, 1638. That's what it says on the side. And these are the three lies right in a row. Uh, right at the bottom, 1638, that is not actually when Harvard was founded. Harvard was founded in 1636, making it the oldest university in these here United States. Hey, you know, the early folks at Harvard, not as good as the current folks, they wouldn't have gotten that date wrong. That's that's exactly right. I, I agree with that. And Ryan, the reason that it says the wrong date is because John Harvard died in 1638. And that's when he made a sizable donation of his library to the school. So that's where the date got, it came from. And on the second line where it says founder, this is the second lie because John Harvard wasn't actually the founder. The school already existed. Massachusetts Bay Colony was the founder. He was just a, a major donor. He was a British donor who donated his library to the school. So they just renamed the damn thing after him. Wait, so the school wasn't called Harvard before then? And they just renamed it after this guy who gave his library? Uh, that, that's absolutely correct. He, he got in exactly really correctly. early because these days it'd be at least a couple billion just to get a, to get a uh, you know, building. 
The whole totally. school, I don't, even, I don't even know how much that would cost. I believe they're going to rename Harvard after the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, right? After his donation. Is that, is that uh, not true? I, I can't confirm or deny that. <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, John Harvard on his deathbed uh, made a, a bequest to to Harvard, and th- that's where uh, the the association came. It wasn't called that prior, but Ryan he actually never saw his name on it because this uh, bequest was on his deathbed, so he had no idea. I mean, can you imagine having something named Ryan Davis University? You never even get to see it in your life. It lives on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I I, I can't imagine because, but if I, I did, I would want to make sure I was getting residuals. You know, like Trump <laughs> University. That's right. Okay, so we've got two lies. We've got 1638, we've got founder. And then the, 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 the third lie is the very top, John Harvard. You look up at the statue, the statue who was carved by, the statue which was sculpted by none other than Daniel Chester French, who also did the Lincoln Memorial, which we talk about all the time. You look at this Daniel Chester French likeness, and guess what? The guy you're looking at, that's not John Harvard. Is it Lincoln? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just he just slapped Lincoln. Up there. <laughs> it's just Lincoln without the stovepipe hat. Nobody's no. <laughs> ever seen Lincoln without the stovepipe hat. No, this was uh, the likeness is actually a student that Daniel Chester French yanked off. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say yanked off. <laughs> Possible. <laughs> it's a it's a student who Daniel Chester French has yanked out of the yard and had sit for the sculpture. We actually don't know what John Harvard looked like because there's no portraits of him, no statues, no busts. So for all of time. This man's name lives on through history all the way through the future. This isn't even what he looked like. And he didn't even know the school was going to be named after him. I mean, it's absurd. It, it, it is pretty absurd. Yeah. I didn't know any of that story. They don't cover that in that scene, the social network. <laughs> it would be a very long scene. I'm sure there's yeah. a cut. There's a cut version where they get into that. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> And Ryan, there's of course other other great stories in history that you can learn all all around the yard. One of the the major things you'll see is the Harry Elkins Widener Library. That's the main library. It's the grandest building with these huge uh, pillars. You'll see very academic students going in and out. Harry Elkins Widener died on the Titanic, for example. And uh, and and there's great stories about the history and founding and donation of that library in his memory. But what I would really encourage you to do for so many of our listeners are fans of museums, as you and I are. Harvard University, being as old and as rich as it is, uh, has many different museums on its campus that maybe you know aren't at the level of fame of the fine arts museum, but are wonderful collections on their own. So I really recommend that folks check out the Harvard Art Museums, which consist of three museums, the Fogg, the Bush Reisinger, and the Arthur M. Sackler Museums. And if I had to pick one, if you only have time for, you only have an hour to check out these museums, go to the Fog. The Fog was uh, renovated just in the past five, 10 years. And uh, it's, it's it's a beautiful open space, really, really modern galleries, a great art collection from all over the world really interesting collection of coins. They have a, a ancient coins that you can investigate, really uh, a unique collection. And uh, uh, Sackler, that name sounds familiar for some reason. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, now, I can't tell. I'm in a little the, bit of an opiate haze. but uh, they, <laughs> they are considering renaming it. Uh, one piece that I would call out that you could check out if you do end up visiting the Fog is there is a, a special gallery, uh, I believe it's on the third, maybe the fourth floor, where uh, they have preserved these Rothko paintings that were originally in a meeting room elsewhere in Harvard, but they were being faded by the sun. And what Harvard did was they relocated the paintings to the Fogg Art Museum and custom built a gallery where special, uh, very advanced lighting techniques are used to show the true former non-faded colors uh, on the paintings. And at four o'clock each day, You can actually see the projectors change one by one, and the colors actually revert to the faded painting itself. So it's a really fascinating transition to watch. I have never been to any of these museums. I know. Honestly, you could spend several days touristing around Harvard, and uh, it would not disappoint. And I assume some of these are not open to the public right now, but in a matter of time, folks will be able to come back. Oh, yeah. Uh, most of these are, gen- uh, you're talking COVID times, but most of these are public museums. They're open museums that you may have to pay a small fee. If you know somebody who's associated with Harvard, uh, I believe their ID can get a certain number of guests in with them. Um, but, you know, they are, they are world-class collections. 
Well, Kieran, I'm, I'm going to use your ID next time I'm in Boston and go check some of these <laughs> it's, out. It's highly outdated at this point. <laughs> um, and Ryan, one other museum that we'll be sure to visit is the Museum of Natural History that Harvard has. And uh, this museum is, is world-renowned for a very strange collection that it holds. And this is called the Blaschka Glass Models of Plants. Have you, have you heard of this at all? No, but it sounds a little bit up my alley. I like models of things. Okay, so it, actually, no, yeah, but they're not miniaturized. These That's are, okay. They, I like if, if as long as plants are small anyway. So you know. So this is a, a fascinating story, which is in the late 19th century, Harvard was trying to figure out how to preserve plants from all over the world for the study of botany and plant biology. And they figured, you know, yes, we can dry plants, but it really doesn't give a lifelike representation of what this plant looks like out in the wild. And they came to this decision that they were going to hire glass blowers. And so they hired a father-son team, these Czech glass artists named Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka. And from 1886 to 1936, they created 4,300 glass models of 780 plant species. And those are today preserved in the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And people travel from all over the world to see these glass models because you cannot believe the fine detail that they capture. You could look at these and believe that they are real plants uh, before you realize how incredibly uh, fragile they are. And then, and then when you realize that they're also just these gorgeous works of art. I, I'm looking at them now. They're, they're unbelievable that they're, these are all flowers. They're astonishing. And, and let me particularly recommend this is a real place to bring your mom. Moms love this gallery. I blew my mom away when I brought her here. So, so if, if, you, if you got your mom while you're visiting Boston, uh, you can't miss the glass flowers. I, I, my mom would also love this. Uh, definitely one for the list. No question. And then, Ryan, my fi- I'm just going to give a final outdoor recommendation while you're here. You know, you've now seen MIT. You've seen, you've seen Harvard. You want to now you got to get some physical activity. Go kayaking on the Charles. If you're here in the spring and especially in the summer, you can rent a kayak and 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 explore by water the the lovely uh, waterway that flows by these great universities. You go under really nice bridges and you really get a sense for how uh, Boston as a city really puts great nature right next to a great city. But you might, you know, folks might be able to see like one of the Winklevoss twins or something while they're out on Charles River, right? Like, I, I, well, you, you've now, uh, now you've, you're making me reveal. I am actually working on 4,300 glass sculptures of the Winklevoss twins. <laughs> <laughs> I want, that's what my donation to Harvard is going to be. Life size, by the way. And they are tall, they are tall gentlemen. They are, they are large men. They're no, nearly, that's, two, that's, two, two, nearly two smoots. That's a lot of glass. Absolutely. Two well, smoots. Right. Oh, God. Uh, I'm exhausted, Ryan. That, that was a great tour around Boston. But luckily, we do have one more episode. We're going to focus on the Boston Harbor Islands. But for now, I think it's time for the last stop. The last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. All right, Ryan, we are here in the last stop. This is the, the last segment of the show, the final segment of the show. It's your favorite segment. It's my favorite segment. It's popularly known as the people segment. And it's where we each bring one thing each week. It's, it's, a mo- it's, it's sort of a, a generous segment, right? Because we are giving unto the listener uh, anything. Any, any one thing could be a memory, could be a, an ex- uh, something that we're planning, could be a piece of gear, could be uh, an experience, could be an article we read, anything Feeds the spirit of wanderlust within us, even during the workaday week. So, no, Ryan, most weeks you come, and in fact, I can't think of a week that you haven't come with the last stop. So, I'm going to ask you as I oh, ask you, you I every mean, week. You, you don't give me much of a choice. No, that's true. <laughs> you assign me it in the document. <laughs> now, Ryan, do, <laughs> hey, let's not show how the sausage gets made. <laughs> Ryan, do you have a last stop this week? I do, yes, Kieran. I do have a last stop this week. Um, <clears throat> I do have, okay. you want to tell me what it is? <laughs> I do have a last stop this week, Kiernan. Um, so, you know, I'm at the point now in the pandemic where, you know, we've rented zip cars and we've just sort of drove everywhere within like a 90 mile radius of New York City that yeah. is either outside or like safely inside, you know, like yep. a museum yep. or something. So, um, you know, a couple weekends ago doing some research and stumbled upon this thing that really hit a lot you know, a lot of buttons for me. 
And it's called Northlands. And it is this sort of epic miniature train show um, in New Jersey, <laughs> like so in the you, middle so of nowhere. You <laughs> so you basically Googled, you know, miniature displays in 90 minutes. No, wor- wor- worse than that. I Googled like, like weird tourist attractions, <laughs> in New Jersey. And I'm just like going through, I found like a whale. You could like a massive whale. I mean, like we're not driving two and a half hours to see a big whale. <laughs> Who, I'm like, yeah. probably not going to emerge <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's like, you know, it's like a, like a big, you know, model or whatever. Oh, wow. um, it's a model. Yeah, but well. this is not about that. I haven't been to the whale, so I can't speak to that. Sure. But that's a future last. <laughs> pretty, uh, depends how long the lockdown lasts. Sure. So um, this place called Northlands popped up and, you know, like the internet presence, it could go either way. Yeah. It uh, could be like a really dismal sort of thing or it could be really uh, kind of charming and fun. Um, and it turns out to be to be charming and fun. Um, you know, it, it started in like the 1970s in this guy's basement where he would basically build he built this big model train set. And every year he would make it look like Christmas Town, and his friends would come over for a party. And they were like, this is an amazing train set. You know, you you, you should you should show this to more people. And so yeah. he would like host events in his basement. And then obviously at some point. His basement became way too small for this, you know, massive train set. So it was moved to a larger facility where him and his family ran it for a bunch of years. It shut down his family. Like, you know, he, he got old, he retired, you know, he can't run a train empire for forever. Um, and the kind of the place went under for a couple of years, wasn't really active. And then it was bought by a new family and, and, you know, renovated. And to the extent, I don't really know what that means, but new lights and cleaned it and stuff, opened the doors and, you know, you kind of, you walk through a guided path. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes about, you know, it takes well over an hour if you're, if you're remotely even paying attention to all the details mm-hmm. uh, in this massive train set. What's fun about it is, you know, it's not, he's not trying to recreate any specific cities or worlds, right? It's, it's like just sort, sort of like rural, there's a little city section, but mostly just like small town. Like, you know, you might just be anywhere upstate New York. I mean, how, how, and how trains. massive are we talking? It's, I mean, it, you know, I'm talking, you, you're walking, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a, like several football fields or something. I mean, it's really oh big. God. It's oh really, God. really big. Several yeah. football fields. It's massive. And when I'm, I say I'm this, actually shocked that you know the size of a football field. <laughs> well, I, I, I might not, I might be. Getting the comparison <laughs> completely wrong. It's the size of a Broadway stage. No, you know. It's oh, like, <laughs> well, oh my gosh! Wow. <laughs> um, How many taps would it take to, to, to round the perimeter? But they've got hundreds of, of trains that are that are are live on on any given day. So just a lot of trains happening, and and it's sort of it's like really quirky. Like you know, like there's this character grandma who is apparently this very wealthy woman because she has a lot of houses in the in Northlands. Oh um, but like she always like weird things are always happening to her houses. So she has a house that's like in the center of a gorge where apparently she was the only one who refused to sell her house to the mining company. Oh. So they just mined all around her. So oh, they built lovely. this. Like, yeah. yeah. So they've, they've got that as like a story. They've got this one town that's got like a what looks to be a really awful train crash. I mean, just people people screaming and like people, <laughs> people just like all around watching, but the little sign says no one was injured. I don't quite understand how that's possible. <laughs> well, I think they have to do that. For the kids. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, you know, um, but there's just like a lot of little, you know, he, the, the attention to detail is really high and he built, you know, he's built like these really elaborate ski houses on top of mountains and monasteries and everything is hand built. Like it's not like he went. So to the, that's what I was going to ask. So yeah. how do you know, get a sense of how he crafts these things? I, they, you know, they're all built from different materials. I mean, the, the, you know, some of the, you know, there's some signs that talk about like the sticks that he used or how, how many things in the cathedral. Sure. Um, but it's all like, you know, it is all hand done, hand painted. Um, and, and that makes it all the more impressive. And like, it's hard to even imagine. We were trying to figure out like some of the sections are so large that it's unclear how you would, a human would get over there if the train fell off the track or if like oh my the house fell down the mountain. Yeah. In fact, there's a couple of places where, it, you know, a house has fallen down a mountain because that, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> and they just haven't had a chance to, you So know. this transit <laughs> is so large, there's actually seismic activity that happens <laughs> underneath the crust of yeah. the railroad miniature. Yeah, it's, 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 
It is, it is, a uh, you know, but at the same time, it's got like a 1970s vibe. Like it doesn't feel like there was this, this thing that was in, in Midtown Manhattan for a while. I forget if we talked about it on the show, Gulliver's Gate, which was like a, a Gulliver's world, a miniature world, but it was like a miniature Moscow and a miniature Paris. And it was, it was grand, right? Yeah. But there was nothing like cute about it. There was no attempt to be quirky. It was like, it was like printed, like 3D printed corporate, corporate like cities, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This has all, you know, this was clearly like the vision of a, of a, a man of, you know, uh, who really liked his models. I mean, this was a singular sort of like, like vision. So it's, it's a different vibe. It's a different feel. It's got a lot more heart and character than sort of a mass produced uh, thing you might see at like an amusement park or something. Oh, I'll just add, how long of a drive was it from, from the city? It was like an hour and a half drive. Okay. Yeah. From the city. Yeah. Flemington, New Jersey, you know, not, there wasn't like a whole, a whole lot going on, um, in Flemington. Uh, in fact, when you're driving there from New York, it's almost like, you you know, like, is there really going to be a really big, fa- big facility with a massive train set out here? Like, does that yeah. make, does that make sense? <laughs> you know, right. um, but yeah, you, you, you do, uh, you, you do, you do come upon it and, uh, yeah. And it's, it's sort of near the New Jersey, Pennsylvania border border. Cause we, we drove around new hope and stuff afterwards. So, um, it wasn't that far. Great. Well, we will of course link to it in the website, maybe throw up a, a couple photos on the old Instagram. Oh, I, I took quite a, quite a, quite, it's, it's a good, it's a good did. place to Insta. No doubt. Man, oh um, man, it's a, this is a real passion project. I'm very impressed. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, do you have a last stop this week, Karen? Uh, Ryan, not only do I have a last stop. I mean, this is something I feel like we should both stand up and salute for my last stop. That's because we, as Americans, have just gotten the 63rd National Park. We have a new national park. Ugh, all those people who have been to every national park now are like, you know, getting out their, their park gear. Uh, you're, gotta, I, obviously, you're talking about Connor Knight, <laughs> uh, our, our past guest who had visited every park. He visited 59 parks, wrote a book about it. They soon added three further. And now there's a fourth that he's got to get to, uh, though. I know he did confirm he has visited those three. And I'm sure he's I'm he's probably on a bus right now on his way here. Yeah, I'm surprised that today's show didn't do a segment. New park. You well, know. he's he's also on CBS Sunday morning. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, so, and I and if I had to guess, they are probably working on that segment. So, this is called the New River Gorge National Park, and what's super exciting about it, from our point of view, is that it is actually in the eastern part of the country, where we do not have many national parks. We've got Acadia, Shenandoah, we've got uh, Great Smoky Mountains, Everglades, and now we have New River Gorge in West Virginia. And uh, it's, this, is, this protects about uh, 72,000 acres of land uh, that flank a 53-mile gorge. And uh, it's, it's particularly renowned for the New River Gorge Bridge that spans this, this gorge. And you have just beautiful, beautiful uh, rolling hills uh, covered with, with trees. It's a place where uh, kayakers uh, love to go. And what's, what's very interesting is that now that it's attained this, uh, this, this level of protection that you get with a national park, it was actually fairly controversial because this was an area where hunters used to be allowed in. So of the 72,000 acres that we were talking about, over 65,000 of the acres are, uh, are a nature preserve and hunting can still continue in those areas. And it's only 7,000 acres directly around the central canon that is going to be the official national park land that is protected. We well, you know sometimes, you know, I know that in, in the eastern shore of Maryland that if, if they, they, they don't issue the hunter, hunting licenses, the deers literally just are everywhere. So they, sometimes. They go crazy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, maybe that'll make the park, you know, a little safer and better for everybody. Yeah. Even well, the animals. And I also. You know, I also think they like were very much recognizing, uh, uh, you know, how how the land is currently being used. And as you transition to a national park, you have to recognize that, you you, you know, you need to negotiate with those who live around it, how the land's going to be. And hopefully this will be a real tourism boon for the uh, for the area. But there's one particular um, quirky little provision that I also think is very interesting, which is so I talked about this, this new river gorge bridge. And is actually in the legislation that is uh, making this area a national park that the bridge can still be used at least once a year for 
base jumping, which is this extreme sport where you jump off a bridge into a cliff with a parachute. And uh, th- you can't do that in any other national park. So the, the, the New River Gorge National Park is the only base jumping friendly national park. I mean, there, there's your marketing campaign right there. Yeah, I mean, it is quite a bridge, too. It, it, it looks awesome. Um, I, I've never I would never base jump um, because, you know, I, I, I skiing makes me friend. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but, you it, know it would, I think I think it can be really hard for a national park to know how to attract visitors. And uh, not only being a base jumper, but coming to watch the base jumpers is a great, sure. a great yeah. reason to, to book a hotel, to get down to this new national park. And Ryan, it, it is not very often in our whole history. We only have 63 national parks. So th- this is a major, major achievement. I feel like it's not getting the coverage it needs. And uh, so I encourage everybody to, to dig in and learn more about this national park. I, I look, I have a feeling that one of us is going to get there in the, in the, you know, in the spring or early summer and there'll I, be an episode dedicated to this park. I well, imagine that that's going to happen. To be honest, I was, I've already been uh, trying to contact the uh, superintendent of this park, but what, w- if there's one thing I know about national park administration, it's that they are not good at email because <laughs> mo- most of their job is, you know, looking at the health of the trees, et cetera. Yeah. And so uh, I, can you imagine I, what a, what a lovely job that must be? Not have to worry about email. I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think about it constantly. Um, the number so, of emails in this 14 minute conversation that are in our boxes. <laughs> So anyway, this is a, a big moment for, for all of us in the world because we're going to be protecting this great national treasure. Uh, you know, big national park fans here on the pod. And hopefully we can do a follow-up episode where one, maybe one of us visits or we just get somebody on from the park to tell us about uh, this new great, uh, na- you know, it's a, it's a land that we Americans now all own. Oh, I think, uh, you know, makes me proud to be an American again. Thank so, you, Joe Biden. I, I, assume you, I, assume, Biden. I assume this was all Joe Biden personally. <laughs> oh, no, this was a Donald Trump. Move, absolutely. I <laughs> yeah. mean, we all know natural yeah. environmentalist yeah. Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, that's why the golf course that you didn't mention uh, oh, that yeah. makes that's a right. lot of sense. I forgot that <laughs> 70,000 is set aside as a golf course. <laughs> uh, now, Ryan, we are, uh, you know, wrapping up part two of my three part Boston trilogy. But we don't want to follow. We don't want to give the third installment right away. So what are we talking about next week? Well, I think sticking with the B theme and sticking a bit with the, you know, travel around your, your, your hometown, your town theme, you know, where you live, uh, we're going to talk about Brooklyn. I'm going to talk about Brooklyn um, and all the cool things there, there are to do in Brooklyn, uh, both in, uh, you know, pandemic times now, but also as, as, you know, the world starts to open up again, um, you know, there's so much to see and do in Brooklyn. And I'm going to brag about it a bit. I, I'm, I'm glad that you're doing a Brooklyn-centric episode because, one, we've gotten the request from listeners to have a Brooklyn-specific episode, given Absolutely. that you live in Bushwick. And secondly, I have noticed a trend in guidebooks, that guidebooks that used to put out a New York guidebook are actually putting out a New York and then a Brooklyn-specific guidebook. So clearly you're right that we need to dig deeper into just this one emer- <laughs> Is it an emerging borough? It has emerged. It has I emerged. Think it's, I think it's emerged on the world stage. Like if you're a millennial or Gen Zer, you know, you, when you go to New York, you're like, I want to go to Brooklyn, you know? And I know um, the, the local borough president of Brooklyn is running for the mayor of New York. So if you land that position, I mean, n- now you're overshadowing Manhattan. That's just the wallet. Let's not unpack that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of feelings on that topic to bring in. In the last minute here, the pod. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, looking forward, looking forward to that. Um, and you know, it'll be it'll be nice to not have to uh, you know get on a flight, you know, not have to call the cabin crew next week uh, when we talk. We're about still going to call the cabin. Crew. I know that's the sound effect. <laughs> well, until we meet in Brooklyn, I'm Ryan Davis, and I'm Kiernan Schmidt, and this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seed taken, Boston and Brooklyn. Ryan, do you think maybe I should do the third installment in a Boston accent the whole time? Uh, Kieran, go back and listen to how you sound now. It's like, <laughs> oh, please. you oh know, it's God. like Casey Affleck and Gone Baby Gone. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>